All right. All right. I gave a talk the other day, and someone described this as a pickle. I don't know why. It looks like a pickle. It was in Washington, they said. But, uh, so this is an interesting for me combination of economics. Actually, my PhD is in economics, but I wrote a law degree as well. But also, I've been working a lot on the ICT sector since the first uh, personal computer hit the desk in 1984, and then the internet came online in 1994. Increasingly, as the digital economy has grown, intellectual property rights have become more and more important. In fact, for the economy generally, intellectual property rights have become more important. So that the investment in IP, as it's measured, uh, now exceeds an investment in physical infrastructure and physical assets. Uh, so, increasingly, intellectual property rights, which is a lot of what uh, Apple is, as you understand, uh, figure in nearly, in nearly everything. Um, but in terms of international border transactions, it becomes a really major issue because you're trying to price something that may be a patent or a copyright uh, in order to identify the market price. So, intellectual property, um, digital, econ digital uh, markets, um, also, the European context, from, a very, from the time I was doing my law degree, just very soon after Britain joined the EU. Uh, my, in fact, my, my master's thesis, and my, my honours uh, paper in law, was on uh, an analysis of whether Britain could, how Britain would be able to leave the EU, uh, which has become, uh, yeah. become a big issue. Because as a New Zealander, we were very hopeful it would have done it sooner. Uh, <laughs> because 90% of our trade was with Britain, that's a point at the end of the EU. And with 300% you know, tax on sugar, and hundreds of percent tax on the dairy, it was very hard to find, find a market. So, so thinking about the competence of various institutions within the EU and doing constitutional law was a big part of it. And then um, tax transfer pricing has become increasingly important, it's particularly after the GFC. A lot of governments have gone into debt and uh, are very keen to try and shore up their tax base and, uh, and generate revenue. So it's obviously a very interesting issue. Uh, besides the fact, as someone mentioned before I started, that um, we will probably have at some time or we'll contemplate voting iPhone. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's an interesting company, company. So it's got a lot. I can only just talk to a couple of issues. One is uh, whether I think the, uh, the commission got its uh, its judgment right it's, it's in, in the allocation of profits between between Ireland and and, uh, and the rest of the world, if you will, or the US. Um, and, and that goes to the issue of uh, setting a competitive market price. Um, and the second is that uh, when you step back and you think about the institutional arrangements, is the Commission well advised, uh, or is it well advised to allow the Commission to become increasingly involved in this kind of activity? So the, 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 the case though is this one where the Commission decided Ireland must recover 13 billion euros, a lot of money, uh, only from 2003 to 2014. Um, under the EU state aid rules contained in 107 of the Treaty of the Functioning of the T uh, European Union. So when you think about the state aid rules, I think about them as, uh, originally anyway, an attempt to try and get, get a handle on the way in which governments get involved in the ownership of, of commercial trading entities and maybe subsidising state champions uh, like Volkswagen, so provincial government ownership in Germany, Renault and uh, and uh, Citroen have got some form of French government involvement. Th these kinds of government involvement in private enterprise provide these corporations with tax guarantees, in a sense, or implicit state guarantees, which make it hard for other companies to compete. Um, so that's how I originally understood the state aid rules. But increasingly now, we're seeing these cases emerging which are focusing on the tax system. So where you've got subsidies and, and licenses and, and regulatory advantages being conferred, on a uh, company by a state, you could see that other states would be concerned that their, their companies would find a difficulty competing on the European wide single market with such a uh, tax system. So it would distort competition. It's quite clear you can see how it distorts competition. And it's, it's a much more transparent problem. You can, see, you can see the expenditure, you can see it going into a bank account. This is about like two or three steps removed. How do you get from the tax system to an advantage to a corporation? that then distorts competition, because it's all about distorting competition, which is the other thing that's interesting about this case is it's actually not tax law, it's competition law. It's talking about distorting competition. So the focus of the Commission's decision is on two Irish tax rulings from 91 and 2007. Excuse me if you know all this background, but I just thought I'd throw it up so we could all remind ourselves or those who didn't get up to speed. 
Um, so you've got the incorporated companies, Apple Sales International, which I'll refer to as ASI, and Apple Operations Europe, AOE, uh, Irish incorporated companies that are fully owned by Apple Group, which is ultimately controlled by Apple and the Amer American Corporation. So this is the, you know, the, the diagram the Commission has used and can generally be used to describe the corporate structure. Uh, you've got Apple Incorporated up here, owning Apple Operations International, which op owns Apple Operations Europe, which op owns Apple Sales International. Now this is the one that this case is all about, actually. This is 95% of the, uh, or more of the tax, the 13 billion, said to be outstanding. The money was parked in here. And they were exempt under a section of the Irish law because it was a uh, it was an entity owned by a foreign corporation which had a, 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 a didn't have a, a, a trading exemption applied under 23A. So, so the, this, uh, the other element, I mean, I've listed a lot of elements of this case that are in play here, and so people can be coming at it from different angles. But the other element that's interested in here is that we're talking about non-market transactions. Not they're not market. They're not intermediated by a market. Uh, clearly, Apple Inc. and Cappuccino has done a whole lot of IP research in Stan in, from Stanford and whatever, and it's come up with some great intellectual property, and it's got patents, and it's got copyrights. And uh, what it then does is it inter has an internal market where it sells that, those rights and buys other products and services and collects and develops other assets in other corporations that it owns. So, all, so normally, if this was a market, you'd see a price, but it's an internal market, and uh, so people worry, well, is it really an efficient price or is it a competitive market price? So the idea would be if these market prices within these corporations governing the transactions between them are not driven by a competitive market constraint but a, an internal hierarchy uh, and, and if the corporation's design is actually not driven by efficiency like Oliver Williamson, what government structure should we assign this transaction to to get the most efficient outcomes, but rather how do we minimize tax then one way to do it is set a very a different price in the transaction between one institute, one organisation in the hierarchy and another. So if one organisation at the top is in a low tax environment, you charge above the competitive market price, say if you're selling a car, Toyota gets into these cases where it sells cars around the world, and it's argued that it may charge too much for the car in order to shift the profits back to another lower tax environment. So the way the tax authorities come in to assess whether this shifting of profits through price manipulation is occurring is they go looking for what would be a competitive market price for these transactions uh, in here. And, and that's the essence of what's going on because these corporations down here which do enter the market and obviously sell iPhones to people in America and, and Europe in competition with Samsung and, and European potential competitors as well, Nokia and, and so on. Um, they will be able to maybe distort the markets that they're in, acting and competing in downstream if there's some kind of distortion upstream within the corporation. Uh, so you can get a distortion because of relevant prices. They might, you know, people often think, talk about predatory prices where a corporation, this is a competition law idea, might drop its price below cost for a while to kill off someone. But if, if you've got a lower cost base because of tax advantages, you don't even have to drop below your cost, you can just drop it below everyone else's cost and kill off competitors. So that's the idea that we may be trying to minimize that risk, particularly when it's got the state as a collaborator, if you will. The idea is the state comes along and designs its tax system perhaps to advantage a corporation within the hierarchy, that then that gets passed through to a competitive advantage in the final product market. So what I'll look at is the relevant law and what's called the arm's length principle. Now, this has come out of the tax law the, uh, decision making and, and, and uh, thinking where we're trying to work out, is this company paying sufficient tax in Europe? The way we do that is we work out, well, did it pay competitive market prices for the products it imported? Because if it did, then we don't care, profits lie where they fall, right? And they're taxed by whoever has the profits in their jurisdiction. And they can tax it high or they can tax it low. There's two issues, the tax base, and then there's the issue of the tax rate. So some of this debate is really, often amongst some, seem, may be seen to be a concern about the, uh, the tax rate of Ireland being too low, but really, that's not what this case is about. This case is about what the tax base. Is the 12.5% corporation tax being applied to all the relevant profits? Or has some of the profits that should be in Ireland, and therefore in Europe, being sequestered off to some other jurisdiction 
by means of a price being charged too high, pushing profits to a lower tax or no tax, perhaps, jurisdiction. But the arm's length principle is the principle we use to work out whether the prices for the products transacted within the corporation are at a competitive market price. And if they are, not only should profits lie where they fall and be taxed where they fall, there can be no distortion in the downstream market. So that was what was picked up by the commission, that this, this principle in arm's length, the arm's length principle, which was used to decide who should tax what, i.e. to avoid double taxation, because you know, they're the world's biggest corporation, more than a trillion dollars, there's a lot of tax at stake, everybody would like to get a share of Apple, if the 170 countries of the world each taxed Apple 30%, there'd be no money left. So you have to have tax agreements which say, to try to avoid double taxation, because double taxation is a tax burden which can distort a competition. So you can, like, typically in economics, you can have maybe a distortion due to state aid, but you can have a distortion due to state burden. So you're trying to get the optimum, which is where are the prices that are competitive market prices, then those prices should determine where the tax base falls, then they can be taxed by states how they will. And, and then there's the economic theory of state competition, which comes into play and says that state competition is a good idea, going back to the ideas of Taibu and uh, voting with your feet, keeping constraints on, on uh, governments, uh, and Hirsch, Hirsch, Hirschman, is it? Hirsch. Oh, yeah, his exit voice of loyalty. He said, exit voice of loyalty, he said, with governments, competition is a big issue and a good issue too. You know, you can not only uh, be loyal to your government, the EU, and you can not only voice your opinion and vote, but you can exit, you can go and live somewhere else. And if you don't like France and Germany's tech corporate tax rate, you can go to Ireland. So exit provides a check on the obvious tendency, potentially, for self-interest party, parties within government to grow government by growing taxation beyond its optimal level. So the arm's length principle was all about trying to decide how to efficiently tax, but the, but the commission picked it up as being a means of working out how to avoid distortion of, of competition as well. So it was kind of a, a co convergence of use in this principle. It could be used to determine how the tax basis should be divided, but it also could be used to determine how government intervention on tax might best be conducted so as to avoid distortions of competition. The second big issue then is, so I want to talk about how the Commission applied the relevant law, the arm's length principle. I want to talk about the role of the Commission versus the OECD. Obviously, you know, governments have had to deal with double taxation for a long time. The OECD has been the forum which in most countries that do that. They have double, double taxation and fiscal evasion treaties. Uh, which are bilateral and multilateral. So what is the role of the Commission in all that? Uh, how does the Commission's decision, uh, well, does it accord with the arm's length principle? And, uh, what, and, I, and I conclude actually not well at all. That it, it seems to, it's very hard. All I'm able to access is the 2016 written decision, which came out two months after the original, they announced it in October. But uh, it's not, they don't really clearly elaborate that well how they apply the arm's length principle. So what I want to do is develop an alternative sense assessment, which kind of brings together the idea that maybe there is a problem with the role of the Commission here, and because it's come into play. We're seeing it make a mistake, in my view. Uh, so the European Court of Justice's role will be to ensure that it is better, uh, better aligned to its, uh, its, its, its role and efficiently performing its functions but we don't have its decision. In fact, I thought the decision would come out over fall and maybe over summer, and so I could have been here talking about the court's decision, but I just learned from a more colleague here that they would only just begun hearings. So this is going to be, like most big tax cases, one that runs for years and years and years, for attention. Um, so the relevant law, I'll talk about Article 107, and also what I want to get into are this Irish-US tax treaty, because there was one throughout all the period we're talking about. So in 107, it says any aid granted by a member state or through state resources in any form whatsoever which distorts or threatens to distort competition. So it's really, it's a competition law. It's by favouring certain undertakings or production of certain goods, insofar as it expects trades between member states be incompatible with the internal market. And that's what the Commission has held the Irish government to. The Commission claims the role of the EU state aid is to ensure member states do not give selected companies a better tax treatment Selectivity of a specific measure, such as a tax ruling, has to be assessed against a reference framework, though. So the courts come up with these sort of elements of selectivity and advantage, so the lawyers are trying to define what these terms 
in, uh, in identifying a, uh, a, a, an okay tax ruling uh, mean. Um, and uh, to do that, for something to be selective or to confer an advantage, you have to compare it to something. Selective compared to what? Select an advantage compared to what? So that's where the arm's length principle comes in, or the competitive market reference point. What would a competitive market have generated? What would a competitive market look like? The Commission notes more specifically, profits must be allocated between companies in a corporate group and between different parts of the same company in a way that affects economic reality. That's pretty vague from an economics point of view. I mean, economic reality could be one where you have monopolies everywhere. But, but I think what they're meaning there is that you, you have to uh, you know, avoid the problem that legal structures can be created because we've got this idea of corporate personalities, which creates a whole lot of fictions. And it looks like you've got all these economic players. But they want to look through, if you will, and see what's the underlying economic transactions which that governance structure, if you will, overlays. And ask what's, what markets and products are being transacted here. And that's a very common feature in competition law. In order to decide whether someone's got market power or whether a market's been distorted, you have to first define the market. So that's what an economist would talk call the economic reality, which is you first have to do market definition. And that involves product. Is it an iPhone or is it an uh, iPad or is it, a, is it an iPod? What, what product are we talking about? The functional stage that we're talking about in the delivery of that product to a consumer. The geography, is it Ireland, is it America? At the time, we're we talking today or 2003. These define the market and that means the economic reality. So the Commission endorses the so-called arm's length principle then, if we look through and we look at the market, then this means that the allocation should be in line with arrangements that take place under commercial conditions between independent businesses. So commercial conditions and independent businesses, economists would, uh, and there you are, economists have brought in on these cases all the time, you have testimony, I've given a lot of testimony of tax transfer cases and competition law cases. Our role is not about the law, our role is about the facts, it's like being a forensic accountant and you're talking about the, the meaning of the world of commercial, what, how do we achieve commercial conditions and we talk about the state of competition in the market, if it's competitive or not, if it's a monopoly, it's not, you know. And then an independent business, so the idea is that they're uh, independent businesses competing with each other. If they're, if they're vertically integrated, then the concern will be that someone may be able to leverage market power in one market into another, or transfer or subsidize one, one business over another. What we want to do, therefore, is get this reference point, which is a competitive market involving willing sellers and willing buyers. And this plays into tax law's approach to valuing property generally, because in valuing property generally, courts, and, and this is being confirmed by the Supreme Court of the United States, the Supreme Court of India, and all around the world, they look to what is the market value of the property. And then they use the principle of the willing seller and the willing buyer. And they have another phrase, which is not anxious, so a, a non-anxious and rational, reasonable person, what they would sell it at. And that plays right into economic analysis because that's, that's what we're modeling. We're, we're modeling rational economic behavior in competitive markets. So the advice comes in, is it an arm's length? Economists would say, is it competitive market price? George, this, this is a, probably a naive question, but if you take a technology like a mobile phone, my mobile phone has dozens of functions, and an iPad has dozens of functions, some of which overlap. So how do you define, like if you said the market for mobile phones, right? you know, to some extent yeah. iPads are in that market, but yeah. you can check your Twitter or whatever, but you can't do other things. Yeah. When I used the word function, it was not so much about the functionality of the product, but the function like whether we're talking retail or wholesale or you know, generation uh, in electricity. Um, with, with what an economist uses is to check whether the products, be it the iPad or the iPhone, are in in the same market by the substitution principle, which is, uh, and the test is a small but non-transitory increase in price. So if you saw a small, usually they'd say three to five percent increase in the price of an iPhone, would that induce people to switch to iPads? If so, then iPads are in the iPhone market. If not, they're not. So whereas lawyers, because I've got a lawyer, I often get involved as a student in these situations where you're reading the statute, it's got a word in it and you're trying to find, define the meaning of the word, when it's a tiger, not a tiger, when it's got spots or it doesn't have spots or it's got a tail or it doesn't have a tail. The economist says, no, that's not what we mean here. We mean by market that the products are actually substitutes. So, so something can be induced into a market as a supply, on the supply side by a small non-transitory increase in price 
from another geography, from Africa, in which case then Africa is in the same market. Right? Uh, or it can be from a different product, like as you're talking about um, an iPod, iPod versus an iPhone. And, and really the, the market test of substitution uh, applies also to the demand side. So, you know, margarine and butter, they look different, you know, they're made from different products, like iPads and iPhones, but they're in the same market, clearly. So what we look at is we use econometric analysis and data to test whether a small non-transitory increase in the price of an iPhone would induce people to switch to iPads, but more often we find they go to a Samsung or, or a Blackberry. And so they're in the same market. Um, and, and then we also not only talk about that, but also the barriers to entry. So even though there may not be a product in the market or a rival product in the market that responds to relative price changes, the question would be, would someone maybe enter the market and be in that market as a result? Um, does that does that matter? Yeah. yeah. So, so, so we've got the commission uh, and the court of justice, the commission says, confirming the arm's length principle. So here we have the lawyers taking a principle that was developed by some Princeton economists who helped write the US tax rulings about how do you determine profits that fed into the OECD principles. Um, they're taking that kind of economic analysis that gave us the arms length principle in the tax law area and importing it into the competition law area and saying we can make this fit the bill as well. If it's arms length pricing between Apple and the US and Apple and Europe, for the products that have been transacted between them and then the profits lie where they fall. Similarly with the Article 9 of the US Irish Tax Treaty, both these countries have an incentive uh, to um, you know, avoid double taxation. Um, this is all about the relationships between sovereign states. And you know, this is an interesting area of economics, public choice theory, and you know, a lot of people like uh, Buchanan and uh, Douglas North have written about the role of the state. I mean, the state, from Douglas, uh, Douglas North's point of view, is the monopolist of violence in a geographic area determined by its ability to tax. So this is how central this issue is. Right? It goes to the very essence in the Nobel Prize winning economist's definition of the state. And he points to how the economic success of countries is determined not by whether they have a river or, you know, easy access to trade routes, but whether they had a sensible state that defined property rights and contract rules and enabled people to transact and invest and uh, develop uh, resources to be more productive. So this is a potentially very important area. I've written on small states and I'm, you know, I tend to think the evidence is showing us that small states have delivered better than large states historically and even today. So when you look at the data, people are generally wealthier in small states they live longer, and even now the happiness research is telling us they're happier. Uh, and so this Hirschman idea that's, that people having the ability to exit from one large state and have choice between states, and have a state that's close to you and under your control, that's very important. So for more than 50 years, the OECD has been the forum where member state countries work out who should tax who, what, and how. Because clearly, we're two states butt up against each other and say, it's my right to tax, it's your right to tax, where do we end up? we end up in a war, right? Uh, so that's what defines the boundaries of states. So the process, you've got to agree the principles, you've got to agree the bilateral tax treaty, you've got to implement it in domestic legislation, and Ireland has done that. It has a, 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 a double tax treaty with the US. So what's the commission involved for? You've got Ireland, a sovereign state, entering into a, contra into a tr treaty with the US. So Ireland and the US have a double tax from 1997, so it covers all the period that the commission's looking at this and for the avoidance of double taxation and the prevention of fiscal evasion, which seems to be what the Commission is concerned about, which is tax avoidance, really, tax evasion. And that this, this article is about, this article 9 of the uh, Irish DTT says, an enterprise of a contracting state participates directly or indirectly in the management, control or capital of an enterprise of the other contracting state. So that's what's happening here. ASI, this co corporation I put into in that diagram, is owned by an American company. So, and conditions are made or imposed between the two enterprises in the commercial financial relations that differ from those that would be between independent enterprise. Then any profits but for those conditions would have accrued to one of the enterprises but by reason of the conditions. So what they're saying, in a competitive market, the profit would have been in Europe, but 
America's got this authority over ASI that tells them to shift the profits into some space that pays no tax. As a result, that means we've got a distortion of competition in Europe. And we want to avoid that, so we have to come looking for the reference point and say, where's the, what would the competitive market result look like? What's going on within Apple? And therefore, is it a distortion of competition? What would independent parties dealing at arm's length with each other agree? What would a voluntary buyer and seller in a competitive market agree? So profits versus transfer pricing. The problem we've got here, and we've discovered it over 20, 30 years of trying to resolve this very contentious matter of who taxes what, is that actually using profits as your mechanism for deciding who should tax what, i.e. say, well, that profit belongs there and that profit belongs there, is a very, very bad method. Uh, typically, a lot of things drive profits. Uh, and people in contracts, independent willing sellers and willing buyers, never typically reference profits of each other as a determinant of the sale. Uh, and also, profits can be driven by very strange things, like actually management inefficiency. So if we basically use profits and market uh, evidence on profits to allocate tax or liabilities, that data will be infected by inefficient companies that are failing, that have got low, low profits, and, and you know, so well, you're distorted, you'll have a distorted outcome. Uh, it may be that some corporations have objectives other than, some people want to encourage triple bottom line uh, corporate structures that emphasize not only profits. So profits are residual. What we're really interested in as an economist is total revenues minus total costs. So parties would not agree on profits. Total revenues and total costs are a function of prices for outputs. So if you're, if you're interested in profits, which is the tax, you know, the unit of a taxation, then you're interested in total revenues minus total costs. And total revenues is a function of outputs, prices, and inputs, prices for the quantities, transacted outputs and inputs. So the, the TR here, profits equals TR minus TEC, is price of the output times the quantity of the output sold, minus the price of the input times the quantity of the input sold. So really, if you're worried about that, what you should do is ask, is that a competitive market price of the output? Is that a competitive market price? If they are, then the profits will be Profits should lie where they fall, is the idea. So the economists ask us to look at the prices for the transacted products, not at profits. In order to determine whether profits allocated between associated companies are arm's length, and one thus should assess prices, whether the output prices and input prices in the transactions between the companies are arm's length. Immediately you can see the elements here. The prices in the transactions. What transactions? In what markets? These are the questions that we have to start answering like we were doing a PhD. And arm's length, what do we mean by arm's length? And, and then how do we actually implement, this is good in theory, arm's length principle, but how do you implement it in actual data? What are the methodologies? But here we have this idea that you've got the US double tax treaty, you've got the EU treaty on competition, and they've both got this arm's length principle in the middle. Well, if one of them is delivering on that, what does the other one need to get involved for? So there's some kind of issue about how, how this outcome here might be distorted by errors here or errors here, and how do we manage the process of decision making to avoid those errors. So now looking at the role of the commission, if two conditions hold, namely the arm's length principle is used correctly to determine the tax base, remember the prices are right so the profits land where they deserve, someone's got a high price for a Toyota Camry, but that's because all that revenue should belong in, in, in Japan, right? So the profits should go there because it's a market price, because people can buy General Motors, whatever. So the tax base, but it's also the tax rate of a country is applied to that tax, ba tax base. So if two conditions hold, then there can be no breach of 107. So if the Irish tax rate of 12.5% was applied to the right tax base, no problem. The focus here is on one, it's on the tax base. There shouldn't be an element in this debate about the 12.5, but I suspect politically, that this may, in fact, be part of the drivers of the, of the issue. People don't like the small states of Europe, Luxembourg, Liechtenstein, Ireland, having low tax, corporate tax rates. The French tax rate's much higher, I think up around 40 to 50% corporate tax rate. The German one is much higher. Even in, our, even in Britain, it's 22%, 20% now. So, so our, what we're going to be careful as an economist, looking at this from a self-interested point of view, 
is that there is the risk here of a tax cartel that a group of states get together and they go, well, let's all agree on the price we charge our citizens for the services we provide. And they push up the tax price. So Wixell's idea is that tax prices should reflect the benefit you receive. So that that would be efficient. If you pay taxes equal to the marginal benefit of the government services, that's efficient. But if the tax price goes higher than the social benefit or benefits you're receiving, then it should be reduced. So what mechanisms enable that? That's the idea that tax competition, particularly in the space of capital and very mobile services, will drive tax prices to more efficient levels. Corporations, when you think about it, the owners of corporations who, who appropriate the profits, what are they benefiting from, from the state? The main thing they're benefiting from is the security of property rights. And so what they are looking for is a state that offers rule of law and the surety that when they invest in an asset in another country, they're going to be able to get the return when it comes through. Right? So that's the benefit they get mostly at the margin. If they can get it from one country, they'll move to that country versus another at a lower price. And when uh, a colleague of mine from ANU, Damika Dharmapala, who's now moved on, I think, to an American Connecticut, Connecticut somewhere, looked at tax havens, what he found was that a lot of small states try to be tax havens, but actually very few succeed. And one of the key characteristics of a successful tax haven is that they have rule of law and protection of property rights. So they're actually delivering that service to the corporations. And that's why the corporations are registered here. So what we you know, learn when you work in Treasury, I was Chief Analyst and Economic Advisor for the New Zealand Treasury, was when Britain joined the EC, we went bankrupt within 10 years, and we had a real shortage of capital. We had foreign, no foreign exchange. Capital disappeared. We had to create a tax system that was offering just enough to induce capital to come back and develop and invest in the kinds of products we needed to become a successful economy, having, given that we just lost 90% of our trade with Britain and we're mainly exporting thinly processed agricultural products like milk and sheep. Thinly processed in the sense that they ate grass and then were sent overseas. And I think that was the same with Ireland. Ireland was coming out of a very underdeveloped state and trying to get onto a development path and it sought to develop a corporate structure, tax structure. So if the correct tax rate, be it low, is applied to the same tax base, the right tax base, there's no distortion of competition and there's no arm's length breach of the tax uh, treaties. So there's a spectrum of state aids to state burdens here that we have to be careful of. That if we get worried about these nasty capitalists sequestering profits offshore and avoiding taxation, not paying for the council housing and the health services that they, and the education system, you've got to be careful about going too far as well towards tax burdens. The greatest state tax burden is double taxation. This implies the risk of and cost of error and raises the question of the role of the Commission. So if you've got an underlying economic reality that they're asking us to refer to, and you've got a state aid decision which is yes or no, you can say, theoretically, we can have a number of four outcomes here. We can have the yes, it's a state aid, and true, it's a state aid, so maybe they're right. But they could equally be wrong, in which case they're actually creating a state burden. And they're hurting it at European citizens because European, European corporations will find it more difficult to attract capital. So false negative could be if they said no, which is the concern we've got, it's actually creating a state aid. Uh, but if it's no and it's not, and it is uh, no state aid, that's good. So the problem is that these costs are, uh, need to be minimized. So we're trying to minimize the costs of error. Um, and that's why this principle of the arm's length principle is used to try and enable us to differentiate what the true underlying economic situation is relative to the decision we're making. So this is all about relationships between solid states. So for more than 50 years, the OECD has been the forum where member countries work out who takes who. There are 35 OECD members, keep in mind, and it's much bigger than the EU. In 2015, the OECD member countries had a total population of 1.2 billion, and it accounted for 63% of world GDP and three quarters of the world's trade. So we're talking about uh, you know, a very big, very, uh, uh, and also worked with more than 70 non-member countries of the non-member OECD countries on this tax issue and these tax principles. 23 of the 35 OECD members are EU members. This includes all the major EU companies and two OECD members that are EEA members, Norway and Iceland. 
Um, the European Commission, however, has not been admitted as a member. So the European Commission is not a member of the OECD, which is the forum where all these tax issues get resolved. It's got an observer status, but it's not a member. Moreover, there are six EU members and one EEA member who are not members of the OECD. So um, given some EU members and some EEA members and the Commission are not members of the OECD, it's, it's kind of, you might consider a, a tricky area that the Commission should walk carefully on, where it's, it's, it's an international organisation, yes, but it's m moving into a space of contractual arrangements between sovereign states, which involve non-EU members, and some EU members are not members of it as well. So you, the common ground, however, is the arm's length principle. If, if both are getting this right, then we could say, well, we don't need to worry about it. If the principle in the European Court of Justice can keep us on track. So now we look at the Commission's decision and alternative assessment. The Commission says that it's 13 billion of unpaid tax. Uh, and that means at the 12.5% tax rate, it's 104 billion in profits, right? So there's 104 billion in profits that wasn't taxed. Um, and as I said, it's ASI where uh, most of this money is. The 12.95 of the 13 is actually in the ASI corporation, uh, implying 103 billion, it's alleged, was not taxed by Ireland when it should be. The AOE is a much smaller part of the, of the thing. Um, the Commission alleges the Irish tax ruling relied on the creation of fictional head offices that existed only on paper. Uh, or in the company accounts, and their profits were allocated to these head office accounts were not taxed by the Irish authorities. And it concludes in two, 2011, this is its press release summarising its decision, Apple Sales International recorded profits of 22 billion, 16 billion euro, but under the terms of the tax ruling only 50 million were considered taxable in Ireland, leaving 15.95 of the 16 billion euro not untaxed, and as a result, uh, the international tax paid was less than 10 million of the corporation corporate tax in Ireland. So, you know, 12.5% of 50 million is 10 million. That was the tax that was paid. And 50 million only on 22 billion or 16 billion euro. It does sound odd, doesn't it? So they're saying as a result of claims, only a small percentage of Apple sales were taxed in Ireland and the rest was taxed nowhere. An effective tax rate of 0 0.005. And this became the headline. And this was a real headline grabber. Uh, that this was a terrible situation where all these profits were being taken overseas. And that was the Commission's press release. So essentially they're saying 22 million US or 16 million euros, stick with the euro line, 50 million profits, effective tax rate, 6.2, it's actually 0.4%. So many of this, are, it's actually difficult just reading their documents sometimes to make the triangulate the numbers to get them to court, but it's, it's, it's close to 0.05% if you just try to replicate the maths. So it is, down in the below the, you know, very below a decimal point, below half, you know, tenth of a decimal point. So the commission cites the tax paid as a share of profits. So the share of the profit indice used is taxable income declared to the Irish under the tax ruling over the profits of Apple Inc. earned from ASI. So it's really benchmarking, its reference point is the profits of Apple Inc. from ASI. And so it's referencing the taxable, the methodology it's using here, because it's saying 0 0.05 is too low. And it's kind of like, it's, like it's hard to argue with, right? It's a reduction rate absurd. And if, if they really were paying 0.05%, then we could think, well, that is too low. But have they really just got the wrong base here? Because actually, if this is you know, a thousandth the size, a thousand times as big as it should be, then, then the percentage is actually quite high. So the question is whether it's using the right base when it comes up with a small percentage, it could just be playing with numbers, right? So generally profit-based methods are a poor means of assessing competitive arm's length principles. As I said, profits are a residual affected by many factors. Parties don't usually agree on profit as a basis for consideration in arm's length contracts. And there's a serious risk that profits methods may lead to overtaxing businesses who may be simply less efficient. So you end up distorting competition using profit methods. You've got a risk of distorting competition. It's also not useful for the Commission to focus on the ratio of sales agents' profits, because that's what ASI is. It's really not doing a lot when you think about it. It's taking iPhones and selling them in Europe. As soon as they offer and uh, announce a new iPhone, there's usually queues at the shops. Uh, it doesn't take much to sell these things. They sell themselves. So when you think of it as a principal agent model, it's hard to see how you would reward an agent, like a real estate agent, 
who's selling your house um, against your profit from selling the house. Right? No, I, I wouldn't do that. I'd sell it, I, I might reward them off the sale price of the house. Right? So if I'm selling a $100,000 house and I'm making 10000 profit off them, I would base my percentage off the sale price of 100000 giving them an incentive to raise it to 105000 or 120000 and give me more profit and structure the incentive off the sale price, not off the profit of, not off my profit. Arms length parties are unlikely to target an agent's profits as a mean principal would be concerned that an agent's profits may vary for reasons like poor management and an agent would not be keen to agree to compensation being tied to their principal's profits. So willing seller, willing buyer, we don't seem to have one here. This doesn't look like a good indice, a good reference point. The commission's methodology, to the extent that it made it explicit, looks a bit odd. An alternative assessment, as I said, would say don't go around simply reallocating profits, which is what it's doing. It isn't really talking about distorting competition. It's kind of a say no more. If tax rate is 0.05%, say no more. It must be distorting competition. The methodology you should use is look at the economic reality, i.e. a market definition, look at the relevant parties, that is, look at the relevant transactions, what products have been transacted, and then use a transfer pricing method, which, is to, which there are two of, direct transfer pricing methods, which is go and look at the market price that you find in an actual competitive market with independent buyers and sellers. Right? So that's the preferred method. It's called the uncontrolled price. Comparable uncontrolled price. So if you're talking about the sale price of a car, like a Toyota, into Europe, and you're wondering whether that's the right price that Toyota's charging for its subsidiary, go and look at the market price for Toyota's uh, in comparable transactions in competitive markets where it's competing with other companies. Uh, so there are cars that are substitutes. Or you can look at, the other one is resale minus. So what you can do is you can go for and look for another price, which is the output price, right? So if you know the sale price of the Toyota or, or the sale price of the house, you can say, what's a reasonable compensation for the agent? Deduct that, and then that's the price that should be charged within the firm for the transaction across the border. Right. So you either look at the actual price on a horizontal that's occurring between Apple and its subsidiary in Ireland for the iPhone, or you look at what the iPhone sold in Europe for, and then you deduct a certain amount as a re retail margin, and then that gives you the comparable reference price. Or you could do cost plus, where you go through the whole cost structure of Apple and you build up the cost that it can, plus the return on cost, and that will give you the price that it should charge. So we can, you know, if you think about it vertically, we can go to the retail market and then come back to find a comparable price. Or we can go back from origin and build the costs up to get a reasonable price. Or we can just go horizontally and look for markets and products that are the same, you know, substitutes and what are they selling for as a reasonable price for the trade across the border in the product. So the obvious one to uh, start with, though, is the find the counterfactual or the reference price is the parties. And the, we focus on the two main associated parties, which is Apple Inc. and ASI. Now, you remember one of the um, comments the commission made is, uh, you know, the fictional head offices that have been created by Ireland, by Apple in Ireland, of, uh, and, they, and they don't exist and they don't, you know, they, they're not being taxed and, and so that's a problem. Well, if really you're looking at the underlying economic reality here, then surely you'd have to say as an economist that the underlying economic reality is that Apple Inc. owns these subsidiaries. Apple Inc. is the head office. So if money is being, if products are being sold in Ireland at a market price, profits are accruing to some registered or your Irish corporation, some part of that is, is taxable in Ireland, but the rest really belongs in Apple Inc. in America. If the money is parked in a corporation in Ireland, waiting for remittance back to the US, that's neither here nor there of interest to Ireland, right? The only thing Ireland has to be worried about is, is this tax base part of the tax base I should tax? If it's not, it's up to the other state how much they tax it, right? It's not my money. It's not my business. I'm staying out of it. So we, if we can then sort out what would be a reasonable price between Apple Inc. and ASI for the products that are being sold, then the profits should lie where they fall. And if it's a small amount of money in Ireland, then that's the efficient balance length outcome. 
So the transactions, we define the relevant transactions and markets and focus on the purchase of distribution services. So I'm turning this around because it's a lot easier. You use the methodology that's easier to implement. It's very hard to work out Apple's costs because they're inventing these products that never existed before and they're still selling products that people have never even been able to back solve. But what we can do is say, look, whatever they're doing at that end, we know what goes on in the markets for selling anything. There's huge markets in all, for distribution services and for agents. And it goes from, and, and there, there is an argument that this market is all part of the same market. Whether they're selling, you know, fridges or sinks or iPhones or Blackberries or anything, there's this kind of horizontal cut across the uh, value chain, which is people who just sell things. That's all they do. They specialize in the old Adam Smith kind of approach in the distribution and sale of other people's products. Right? And so the question would be, an economist would ask, well, what would Apple in, a, in these markets, which are clearly competitive and there's lots of non-vertically integrated distributors, have to pay in a market to a distribution agent if it wanted to sell an iPhone in Europe? Because once we know that, then that's the retail price minus. And we know what the, the price that should be paid to Apple Inc. is. Right? The price of the distribution agent is what should be left in Europe. The rest of the price should go to America. So the transfer pricing method, we review the relevant price and determine arm's length price and apply the resale price method. So I reviewed all the methodologies you might use and it seems to me the resale price method is the way to go. And when you do the market definition stage in this competition law area, because this is section 107, which has not got a lot on tax cases, uh, in competition law, a, a, a lawyer would look at product dimension, functional dimension, geographic dimension, and time dimension. In the tax law area, they don't use the same language, but from an economics point of view, it is the same. The answer is principle. They talk about the characteristics of the property, the contractual terms, which an economist would think go to the product, right? Uh, characteristics of the, your functional characteristics you were talking about, iPad, iPhone, contractual terms, uh, you know, do you get service contract after sales service or not? Because if after sales service you pay more, uh, do you bear risk? You, know, you, bear, you pay more, do they bear risk, you pay less? So that determines the price. The functional analysis, well, what we're trying to do is focus on the distribution agent selling something to Apple, not Apple selling something to Europe, but the other way around. And so we're looking at what is it that the uh, uh, agent would charge? And the geographic dimension is according with the economic circumstances. All I'm doing here for the lawyers amongst you is assigning what are sort of, you know, lawyers often have factors that influence the legal decision. And these are the five factors that influence the outcome of a legal decision under a tax case. And these are the factors that influence the market definition decision under the, under the, under the competition law case. So ASI and AOE are Irish incorporated companies that are fully owned by Apple Group, ultimately controlled. AOE is responsible for market manufacturing certain lines of computers, but as we saw, it's a tiny part of this, so I'm not even going to worry about that. Whatever happens there, it's not going to be $13 million. Um, so we'll not discuss at this stage. The reason is that it was responsible only for 0.38 of the unpaid taxes of $13 million. Just put AOE to one side. So I'm simplifying and trying to implement a methodology that is uh, feasible. So ASI forms the focus of its transactions are generating 99.62 of the 13 million of the undue competitive advantage. So Apple Sales is responsible for buying Apple products from equipment manufacturers around the world and selling these products in Europe. So it's not manufacturing stuff in Europe, it's buying them from around the world and then selling them in Europe. It could do all this buying from around the world, it doesn't have to be in Europe when it does that. Um, Apple set up their sales operations in Europe in such a way that customers are actually contractually buying products from Apple Sales International Direct. So the retail agent that they're trying to hire didn't even have to do much because when the, when the agent is selling you an iPhone at the till, the money goes straight to ASI. They don't have to put it in their bank, have accountants keep and track of it. So when you look at what the agent has to do, it's pretty minimal. These phones clearly sell themselves. The money is going straight back into uh, Apple Inc. in America or it should be, or at least it's on the way there at some point. In this way, Apple recorded all sales and the profits stemming from these sales directly in Ireland in the first instance. Attention thus focuses on upstream transactions between Apple companies by which ASI acquires the right to sell Apple products. How, we, how one should characterize and sell these transactions between ASI and Apple's companies upstream. That's often how attention focuses, but I'm saying, well, let's not do, but let's just get familiar with it though. Commission states that the ASI had the rights to sell and manufacture Apple products. 
outside North and South America, the rights to use Apple's intellectual property. On these transactions, the sell and the manufacture, this is in fact two separate rights. So, you know, lawyers use the term rights and they'll tell economists when you use the word products, that's actually what you're talking about. It's what Ronald Coase said. With markets transacting goods and services, they're actually transacting rights, right? You change the nature of the right in the contract or whatever, you change the product. So these are two different rights, so they're actually two different products and we should separate them out. This is the right that ASI took from Apple Inc., the right to sell. Uh, it was the agent. Right? AOE, making things, took a little right down here that we're not even going to think about. So ASI, is the nature of the transaction is the, it's, it's the right to sell Apple products. So I could have gone to Cap Cappuccino and said to Steve Jobs, if I'll sell your products in, in Europe if you want me to. Think probably some of a lot of people did, particularly in the early days. So from a legal and economic point of view, it's thus essentially an agent. And it's in a very competitive market. Um, the questions are therefore, would ASI be paid for its agency services in the arms length relationship? And what was ASI paid for in its agency services? Because if the market price is what it's been paid, then the profits should lie where they fall, even if it looks like you don't get much tax to tax in Europe. So compares price and controlled the comparable and controlled price method controls the, trend, trend, the prices horizontally. What we're going to do is uh, look at the uh, price of the agent's fee. So what's the difference between an agent fee and a distributor? In competitive markets, an agent does less than a distributor. What a distributor does, he actually acquires the property, carries it on his own account, and then on sells it. That, in, that involves a lot more risk. All an agent does is organize for the sale to occur and then gets paid out of the, re out of the price. Right? So the agent is occurring more risk. So you've got markets makers in the New York Stock Exchange who basically buy stock, carry it, and then sell it. And they have a uh, put, you know, a sell price and a buy price, an ask price and a sell price. And then they have to work out what's the difference between the ask price and the sell price after they bought something. And what they do is, you know, there, a lot of techniques have been used like black shoals or whatever that have used to evaluate the difference in price between sell and buy for distributors, and it's much higher than for a, an agent who doesn't actually acquire the property. So you can get agents' fees in competitive markets between 0.5 and 3.5. Distributors' fees are much higher. Uh, but clearly ASI is not a distributor. It's not acquiring the iPhones. It's just merely you know, organizing for their distribution and doing very little when it comes to actually selling them. So what was ASI's fee? What we should look at is, an, I think, an incentive compatible principal agent arrangement where I wouldn't pay them off my profits if I was Apple, I'd pay them off what they sell the product for. Because if they get a good price, then if I'm giving them, say, 1%, which is, you know, it's within the range, if I give them 1% of their revenues from selling my product, then they've got an incentive to push those revenues up to get a good price for me, right? Which is good for me and good for them. So that's incentive compatible. So that this, this would be expressed off the sales price. So we can roughly, because we don't have access to the underlying data, the, car, the court will, and of course the, uh, the tax authority of Ireland does. But if you go to the Senate data, uh, and you know, what I've had to do is populate this where I could get data points. What I'm interested in is the global Apple sales, which is say, take 2011, 77 billion. EU sales revenues of that was 34 billion. EU pre-tax income is 15.79. These are taking out of the commission statements, so they're paragraph 21, paragraph 20, or their 2014 statement of the facts. So the commission's giving us these numbers. And then it says ASI turnover is 0 0.058. So that's AI's, ASI's revenue, right? And that's the total revenue from Europe. So you would think then that this expressed as a percentage of that would give you the agent's fee in aggregate. So if you had a whole millions of transactions and they were each at 2% and you added them all up, then at the total the revenues would be 4 divided by 2, the turnover divided by 2, EU sales. It turns out ASI is in fact earning 2% of EU sales revenues which as a distribution agent, uh, as we saw, is uh, it's in the zone. It's in what you call a competitive market range. 
So you, you're left thinking, well, this counterfactual of a competitive agent's uh, compensation, this agent fee doesn't look too bad, actually. Um, as shown in the table in row 6, ASI agent's fee falls in the reason allowance range. ASI's revenues as a share of total re revenues, in fact, fall from 2% to 1%. So is that a problem? Well, what you could say is that after setup, ASI's share of total sales revenue was small and declining, which actually makes sense, right, because it's getting more efficient. This might be expected in arm's length renation, reflecting a small and declining contribution of ASI to sales. At the, mar at the margin, the fixed costs that ASI has, that you have to pay them to actually encourage them to participate in the relationship, becomes a smaller and smaller share of total revenues as revenues go up and up and up. And if they become more efficient, then you would expect to have to pay them less even uh, on their in costs. So when you look at this fee here, uh, you know, the taxable income over turnover what they cite to, to, the, uh, to, the, um, to the inland revenue was this was our taxable income in European billions, Euro billions. That's 10% too. That's 10% of their turnover. So their turnover is a reasonable 2%, and their profit that they're declaring on that turnover is 10%. Well, um, and going up, actually they're becoming more profitable on their turnover, so they're becoming more efficient. So it shows that ASI's profits as a share of turnover increased over a period from 8 to 11. This ratio of profit to turnover or revenue appears to be reasonably sustainable for many sales agencies. To be making 10% on profit is pretty good, I would have thought. Um, this rise in profitability is also consistent with the increasing efficiency of ASI over time, learning by doing. So you've got some additional steps that the EU is doing that, that are really you know, sort of confusing things in a way. They're, they're taking taxable income on EU sales, they're taking taxable income on EU pre-tax, and they're taking Irish tax rate as a percentage of nine, uh, which is taxable income on EU tax. That's how they get their 0 0.05 and their 0 0.04. So they're looking at profits simply as the ratio over income. And it's, it's not, as I said, it's not an arm's length kind of reference point. And, uh, so the commission cites as paid as a share of profits, which is basically taxable income under the ruling over profits of Apple Inc., which we've been through. Um, and so this share of profits of 0.38 of Apple Inc. times the Irish tax rate gives you the 0.05% that they keep citing. And so they're c continually going after Apple Inc.'s profits as the tax base. Uh, it is not however useful for the commission to focus on the ratio of sales agent profits as a share of principal's profits, as I said. Neither a willing agent nor a willing principal would agree to that. Um, an effective tax rate of about 0 0.05. What I did was run some simulations where I get rid of the numbers and I just make it 100%, say whatever it is, revenues are 100%. And then the agency fee uh, could be, as I said, a regional at the low 0.5 or at the high 4 for an agent. Then the A size cost as an agency fee, say they were 90%, so they made 10% profit. Then ASI profits as total revenues would be in this ballpark, 0.05. It's actually reasonable when you just use simulation abstracting from Apple. Um, very small. So the Commission takes into consideration as matters it should not have, the profits in the, of Maple Link in America. And the Commission does not take into consideration matters it should have, which is the competitive market price for an agent. And those are two reasons for judicial review. So on that basis, you could say that the Commission's decision for making a prediction uh, that the European Court of Justice, based on this analysis, might come to the conclusion it's not a good idea. If it doesn't, I'll be interested to see why. So thank you very much.